Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And today we're going to be talking about the long anticipated Risco School Project. And I have with me two gentlemen, um, Andrew DeFranza, and Andrew is the Executive Director of uh, Harbor Light Community Partners. And I have Thad Shamasco, who is the owner and principal of Shamasco Verbiage or SV Design. How do you want me to, what's the better name for you? SV Design is fine. Uh, Samasco is fine also, either one, Walt. Okay, fine. and and they are a, uh, a well-known architectural firm here in um, uh, in Beverly. So um, before we start, I, I'd just like to have the two of these gentlemen tell you a little bit about their, their, their firms, their companies, and who they're involved with. So Andrew, tell us a little bit about Harbor Light Community Partners, your overview, your mission, et cetera, so the, the audience knows exactly who you are and what you do. Thanks. Uh, it's nice to, nice to be here, Walt, uh, with you and with Thad. I appreciate you having us, and uh, nice to be able to communicate with everybody in the, in the community at home in our current climate. Um, so as Walt mentioned, I'm Andrew DeFranza with Harbor Light Community Partners. We're a local, long-standing nonprofit, uh, what's known as a community development corporation. And we do really four things. We create affordable housing. We're, we're developers, nonprofit developers of affordable housing. We operate that affordable housing. We also do some really interesting um, service, resident service models with a number of our partners locally. And then we advocate uh, and educate uh, in the public for affordable housing friendly policies. So those are the, the really the four things we do. I think in a nutshell, I'd say we're, you know, we're here to make sure that people who are otherwise economically excluded have places to call home in our community. Uh, seniors, essential workers, people with disabilities, people who are formerly homeless. Uh, and we do that geographically. So we're, we operate roughly north of Boston, um, about as far north as Cape Ann. We're involved with about 400 units of housing now from a uh, single uh, family house to our biggest building is Turtle Creek in Beverly at 110 units. Um, and we, uh, we focus really on that, uh, that geographic segment and, uh, and that income segment. Uh, we're involved with a number of new projects, much of which we work with Thad and his firm on uh, all around the region. So that includes Briscoe, the Briscoe School, which we're talking about today. But there are other many exciting projects. We're finishing a little one now on Hardy Street, um, right by the train station with Thad and his team. And then we have a few more around the area that are ready to go. Anchor Point in Beverly, Maple Woods in Wenham, Granite Street Crossing in Rockport, and then a few others in the Cooker. Uh, so we're always trying to find ways to, uh, to create more access in more communities on the North Shore. And we're really excited about the Briscoe School and glad to be here with you talking about that. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew. And uh, Thad, um, yeah, uh, SV Design uh, seems to be the go-to architectural firm here uh, in Beverly and on the North Shore. There's been a lot of uh, uh, redevelopment effort here in the last decade or so. Tell us about some of the projects that uh, you've been involved with. Sure, happy to. Again, thank you, Walt, for having us. And a pleasure to be here with uh, Andrew as well. He's a, he's a good guy and fun, fun to work with, as you could probably imagine. Yeah, I mean, we started the company in 1987 and um, here in Beverly, and we've been Beverly-focused. So I think if you've been around, you know, an area long enough and you learn it and you learn the people and you and you, you do what you say you're going to do, you know, the projects kind of come. So I've had some really nice run of projects. The ones we're proudest of tend to be for the nonprofits. Uh, we're actually doing the new YMCA project up in Cape Ann, done a fair amount of work, the Y, the Sterling Center. We're actually working with the Cabot Street Y downtown now. And a fair bit of projects for Andrew and his group, uh, Beverly Bootstraps. So those projects really are great because you really get to work in the community you know, that you live in and really see immediately the impact of your work on, on you, your family, and your friends. So that's basically where we're at here on uh, good old 126 Dodge Street and Route uh, 1A in North Beverly. We also have a, a smaller office uh, based in Chatham uh, serving a residential clientele uh, down there. But basically our, our, our mothership and our, our, our heart kind of lies here in Beverly. 
Well, thank you, Thad. And um, I, I must say from what you've told us, it might give you a great sense of satisfaction to see these projects that you work on come to fruition in, in your community and, and have the benefit to the community that they, that they do. Now, let me, for the benefit of our viewers, um, let, let me just paint a bigger picture here, if I may. Um, the Briscoe School was the old uh, middle school and the city of Beverly, which owned it, uh, declared it surplus a few years ago and they've been trying to figure out what to do with it. So they, they ultimately, I guess a few years ago, a year and a half ago, whenever, let an RFP, and that's why we have these gentlemen here, um, uh, Andrew and, uh, and Harbor Lake Community Partners in uh, conjunction with another partner, won the bid, and, um, and uh, Thad. Uh, now, were you collaborating with Andrew uh, before the bid, when he submitted the bid, or did he engage you afterwards? Uh, no, we went uh, right with Andrew from day one on the project. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we've got we've got the two main men here on this. So uh, let me let me ask you this. Uh, I'll I'll give you um, uh, both a chance to answer this. What were some of the constraints or some of the issues that you had to deal with in answering the RFP? Andrew, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I think um, that will be much uh, more in tune and and capable on the building constraints of which there are many. Uh, uh, and so I'll stick with maybe some of the programmatic and you know, political small P constraints or parameters. Um, so I think the big one, Walt, is, you know, we have been paying attention to the conversation about the Briscoe reuse for many years, well before the RFP came out, uh, as people discussed what to do with the building. And so I think a huge part of it was trying to listen well to what the community wanted that building to do. And we really came away with uh, four things that we felt like the community wanted. Um, we felt like the community wanted affordable senior housing uh, in the building, which is what we led with, which in our case is you know, our, core, our core mission is affordable housing creation. And, and so that, that was um, a good overlap for us. Right, right up your alley, right? Right, near, right up our, right right up your our alley. That's, that's what we're there for. Uh, second, the community wanted the building to remain up. There was a lot of pressure uh, and interest, I should say, in preserving the historic nature of the building by which it meant doesn't come down, doesn't get bigger, doesn't get smaller, um, as well as it being preserved interior and exterior. Uh, the community wanted uh, the open space preserved. So the front, what's known as the turf bowl, which is sort of the wedge uh, right at the front there of the intersection and the soccer field in the rear. Um, and they, uh, lastly, they wanted the theater uh, to be preserved in some fashion. So those were really the four, uh, if there was a Venn diagram, those were sort of the four overlaps we were working with. And we tried to hit the center of that uh, community need bullseye. And so the proposal then matched that, mirrored that as we tried to create responses to each of those high watermarks. Incidentally, if there was a fifth, I think in the process, one of the, um, it really came up that people were interested in the artistic nature of the theater, but maybe in some other artistic elements. And so we added some, uh, uh, a few more units that were preference for artists live workspace. And we added that to the proposal later in the process. Um, so those were some of the parameters we were working with um, as we were thinking about what we were trying to do. And then we had to overlay that onto the building um, uh, limitations and strengths uh, of which there are many and Thad is masterful at trying to figure that out. The one great thing about the building is it's like a tank, right? It's, they, as they say, they don't build them like that anymore. Um, it's quite about 100 years old now, right? Almost 100 years old? Almost 100 years old, yep. 1928, I believe. Uh, so, but uh, maybe Thad could tell you some more, Walt, about the hallways and the limits and spaces and classrooms and all that stuff. Now, Pat, let, uh, I know that um, they, they wanted to keep the facade and some of the structural elements and architectural features and everything. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. What was involved in preserving this, this Beverly icon? Well, I think, uh, as Andrew mentioned, it, it's a tank, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, <laughs> you know, well built, not, no, no sign of structural issues and so forth, um, but also, you know, kind of a bit... Uh, out of date in terms of, of building codes and when you change the use from an educational use to a residential use there's always you know there are other issues that come up related to building code and so forth uh, that said um, the 
natural size of a, of a classroom is pretty much lines up perfectly with the natural size of a one bedroom you know apartment so essentially the classrooms become beautiful one bedroom apartments with those wonderful large windows and and really nice high ceilings and some other benefit of the project is it has the really wide hallways which you would not put in a in a you know current a brand new build uh, you could not afford to have that much sort of inefficiency if you will but that inefficiency leads you know in a way to sort of luxury and an interest in the building. So we worked with, with those hallways. So we're basically working with the building and, and what it gives us uh, as opposed to against it. And when you do that, it, it works out pretty well. I think, you know, some of the challenges are when you have a use like an auditorium used for the public, how does that interface with the use of, of you know, of a senior citizen community uh, in terms of security and, and even acoustical comfort and, and, and those kinds of things. And Pat, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to circle back around with you because I have some images that uh, uh, in a couple more minutes, I won't want you to co comment on those images, okay? But sure. I'm going to get back to Andrew here. And uh, you, you bought the building for uh, $600,000, right? And yeah, we, um, we did not buy it yet, but we have an agreement to well, buy it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 uh, I'm acting as if it's a fait accompli. But anyway, so $600,000 was the purchase price of Groupon. But you, I heard, read somewhere where you're going to spend forty million dollars in in costs to get it to where you know. Uh, where will this money come from? Well, Walt, I was really hoping that I could count on you as one of the early contributors, <laughs> but um, but we'll uh, we we could take that offline. Um, uh, no, we we uh, so mostly this is going to get financed really in two ways, um, and what I re mentioned earlier about the what I would consider the missional or pro programmatic objectives, which were key, affordable housing and historic preservation. In both cases, there is an equity program, uh, public financing equity program through the what's known as the low-income housing tax credit and the historic tax credit. Uh, and that's those investment vehicles uh, are really where there's private equity that comes into the deal. And those are the two primary drivers of the uh, the many millions of dollars that will get invested into that building. One of them having the motive of creating affordable housing, one of them having the motive of, of preserving the historic nature of the building. There'll be other pieces to that, normal debt, um, capital from the city's affordable housing, capital from the state, et cetera. Um, but those, those are the two primary horses that will pull the carriage, as it were. Um, and both of those get applied to via uh, the state mechanisms, the Department of Housing uh, and Community Development is the primary um, source of the low-income housing tax credit at the state level. Uh, so that's, that's where most of the money will come from is those two vehicles. Let me ask you, Andrew, um, uh, Pat mentioned uh, the apartments, the classrooms change. Now, uh, roughly there's gonna be about 90 apartments and tell us how they're gonna be divided up and who, who will have first, uh, first call on those. Yeah, so there are 91 apartments, 85 of which uh, would be age restricted and affordable. Um, and so of those 85, uh, depending on how it gets sliced, um, you know, about uh, 16 of them will be for residents below 30% of median income. Uh, and the balance will be for residents at 60% of median income. Uh, to give you a sense for a single person, um, you know, 60% of median income is a little over, it's probably between 40 and $50,000 at this point, it changes annually. Um, and that's the, that'll be the sort of the cap. Uh, the 30% of median income cap, you're really targeting mostly folks that are on social security and those will also have a rental subsidy associated with them. Um, so that will be something very similar to what we have at Turtle Creek and Turtle Woods, for example, in Beverly. Uh, the, the six units will, uh, will be, they're not income restricted or age restricted. So they're just, they're market, essentially market rate apartments that have a preference for artists. So there'll be a process for artists to apply if they'd like, uh, and they would have um, first dibs essentially at those units. The other 85 senior units that I mentioned will fit within the age restriction and the income restrictions I described. There very likely will then be two other elements that. One is there's very likely to be a local preference uh, for a percentage of those, which means that Beverly folks um, at a certain percentage, depending on what the state approves, will have the first bite at the apple uh, on a bunch of those units. 
Um, and then the rest of that, uh, all of it will be via uh, a lottery. So essentially people will apply when it comes to be time, those names will be randomly pulled. There'll be a preference uh, for people uh, for Beverly, current Beverly residents um, in the way that the sequencing works. But everybody who's eligible to get in the bucket at all uh, has to meet the age requirement and the income requirements. So it's you know seven or eight dimensions, um, but that's the, that's the rough idea. Now the, the, um, the apartments for the artists, these will be combination studios and living space, right? So that they will actually have their studio there. Is that, is yeah, that correct? More, that's correct. It's not, it, and it wouldn't be designed for, in fact, you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, for what we consider heavy duty craftsmen. Like you can't, you wouldn't be like a welding studio inside an apartment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, a, or a kiln. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't probably have a, you know, a large kiln in there. Uh, what's interesting is the, the natural place for them wall was the old locker room wings on the, on the gymnasium, which had, uh, could have separate access from the exterior and ease of bringing in and out materials. And also naturally, uh, if you know, uh, middle school locker rooms, they tend to be built to be indestructible, which <laughs> seems like a pretty good match for the artists and some pretty, they had some good windowing in them as well. So we, it seemed like a natural fit for those studios to fit in the old locker wings. Now Thad, as long as I got you here, I'm going to um, uh, press, um, and uh, now this is, um, uh, these are images that you sent me. I didn't, I didn't sort them in any way, but I'm just going to scroll down and you can tell me when to stop. Um, and now this is, um, can you hear me, Thad? I can, yes, Walt. Okay. Now, so, so th 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 this is going to be called the Briscoe Village for Living and the Arts, correct? Yeah. Yes. And, and as I understand it, the, the, um, the, the city is going to retain ownership of that that little wedge that like uh, arrowhead at the at the at the end of the uh, of the property and then there's a soccer field or something in the back that they will retain correct yeah that's correct so this image here is of the school uh, uh the project is seen from the intersection of sawyer and toza road and that that green in the front was labeled on the original plans as the turf bowl because it had a small contour as it came from the front of the building down toward the point of the triangle Right. So we're, um, while the city retains ownership, we're uh, developing or, or uh, doing the work that would involve, you know, putting in lawn and walkway and benches and so and lighting and so forth in that turf bowl. We're able to keep a lot of the original uh, older specimen trees that were there, but also add a, a lot more trees uh, and, and also a bus shelter for the bus line that runs down uh, on Sawyer Road. So that was, oh, that this, this sketch here, Walt, I'm sorry, was just like a, uh, came right out of our RFP, kind of our first idea of basically noting how we're going to preserve uh, the building and also create this turf bowl. And as I understand it, the, the intersection there of Sawyer and Colin will be slightly modified as you, when you finish the project? Yeah, um, the, the, uh, the thought was that the intersection of Sawyer and Colon Street might be way work better if it was a T intersection. So uh, we made accommodation if the city wanted to do that uh, in the in the near term, they could actually do a they could actually make it a T intersection, which makes for the traffic flow uh, at that intersection work a little bit better. Now let me let, let me scroll down here. Some of these are pretty busy, and um, I don't think you'll mind because our viewers are a little bit too busy for our viewers. But let me scroll down, and when you want me to. Uh, to stop and uh, just uh, just yeah, say. Um, sure, Walt. I think sheet L one hundred and four, which is a couple more sheets down. Uh, this my okay. There you go. That one there. Up oh, that one. Uh, that one right. Uh, L point one hundred and four. I think it was Walt. I'm. S what what was it? Uh, it was the job? color. It was in color overall site plan. That, that one there. Oh, okay. Just went by See, it again. What's happening is I'm getting I'm getting a little bit of a of a drag on my okay there we that, go that, okay yeah that right all right yeah this is this is a good overview of the of the site where you can see on the lower left there the turf bowl with some with a really nice set of pedestrian walkways around it uh, and then right at the front of the school building which would now be the still be the main entrance to the auditorium 
we're, we're create a good drop off space for for buses and, and Ubers and so forth, taxis to drop off folks who are going into the theater. And also that whole front area acts as a nice place, uh, you know, for an intermission if folks kind of wanted to come out of the building and right. stand in the area. So that that traditional kind of crossover between Colon Street and Sawyer Road is being maintained. Yeah. But the big difference now is that the parking areas, which are a little bit of a free form before, are now being well organized and with, yeah. with trees and and, and so forth. Um, the city's RFP was quite excellent and explicit. One thing that they asked for it was that Sawyer Road parking be screened from the butters across the street. So you can yeah. see a number of trees on that line and also a hedge yeah. that's going there to help screen the parking. Also, if you recall where the teachers used to park, that was a big open kind of curb cut. And now it's, it's ordered so there's only a couple entrances in off of Sawyer Road. And I think there's something like 175 trees being proposed in this plan, you know, residential parking is nearer the building, uh, and then out toward the back part would be the auditorium parking and the artists' uh, live work parking. There's also uh, way back by the old boiler room adjacent to that soccer field, which is not quite shown on this plan, is uh, some residential amenity areas a barbecue, a dog walk, a nice little lawn space, uh, some victory garden kind of spaces that's just sort of off the back of the community spaces that are inside the building. So you have the original building with the, with the classrooms uh, as apartments and then the old gymnasium area and some of the backstage areas are now part of the uh, community uh, uh, amenities. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, scroll down a little further. What I do want you to comment on, uh, these are, these are more detail on that trees you talked about sure I, I do want you to comment on some of these uh, you know if, if you if you you could probably walk by that building every day for years and not realize the really fantastic now this is um this is a um, now that according to this there's uh, eight almost eight and a half acres involved here I didn't think it was that big a but you can see the property here and then you can see over in this area is the is the high school field and the football and the high schools right in right in that area. Right in that area out back in this on this plan is where what we call the soccer field. Um, is where I remember when my my little daughters when they were like four and five played soccer out back there. It's not a it's not a huge field, but it was a nice little flat field. So we're keeping that and providing a little bit of shared parking and an access way off of Sawyer Road to get out there. As, as part of the project so the, the residents will have a chance to continue to use that park area that, that's out back. So the, the, these are some of the uh, original pig. You can see the difference here. Why don't you, you want to comment on that? These yeah, are pictures I taken. Think, yeah, sure, Walt, sorry to interrupt. Um, what was remarkable to me about these photos is the ones up top were the original photos from I think the brochure when they opened the building in the 20s. And then we kind of took some photos now. The building did, you know, it's certainly plenty of wear and tear, but the building has stood up really well. And a lot of the original historical features are still there, like the lobby space that's in the, on, the, on the left side. So what we're doing with, a, with the help of a historic uh, consultant is basically preserving the building. It's a fairly high bar. Uh, everything that was original needs to stay, all the trim, all of that kind of uh, work needs to stay and just be refurbished. Uh, changes are meant to be very minimal, and when they are, they, you need to do it with, with a, kind of a light touch. Yeah. And speaking of preserving, I want to go ahead a little bit here and show our audience some of the incredible details that I was mentioning earlier. Maybe you can comment on these. I think it's the next... Uh... Yeah, it's coming up here. Yeah, I think... Yeah, that's the slide there, Walt, the 100.10. You know, for me, who who had two children who went go there and went by the building a lot, um, even, and, and who's an architect, hadn't quite focused so much on the kind of build, <laughs> on the details that the building had. I mean, it, everyone sees the call, you know, the front columned entrance and, and the interesting door entrance ways, but this medallion on the lower right, this plaque yeah. on the lower right, and just the level of details, the headers over the windows, uh, it, and all of it is, was just built to a really nice, permanent scale and, and you know which is why a hundred years later it's it's still there and working yeah. you know our biggest thing on the exterior now is just changing the windows to a new window that would 
match the original historic profile. Um, same with the doors. The doors were changed over the years. We're putting in back doors that would match what was there originally. But I as think in the building gets cleaned, you know. Yeah. As you said, Thad, they, they just don't make them that way uh, anymore. <laughs> no, they don't. No, they don't. Now, um, it, uh, Andrew, let me get back to you. Um, yeah. So is, uh, is this a done? I know the city council approved the purchase approved, uh, you know, you being the, the developer. So uh, uh, when, when why, might we expect, as they say, the first shovel in the dirt yet? Is that something you can see from where you are or, or is that still not clear enough? Yeah, that's a great question, Walt. It's, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the two major funding streams, the historic tax credit and the low-income housing tax credit, we're in the process of pursuing both of those now. Um, we have applied for historic tax credits for the first round this spring. We'll apply for the first round through the State Department of Housing this fall. Um, so the absolute fastest, uh, if, if the state receives it this fall and approves it, uh, we would know about a year from now, uh, which means uh, you know that would be summer of 2021 and probably you would be in construction in the spring or the early summer of 2022. Um, so that would be, that would be very quick. Uh, the funding rounds at the state are generally only once a year. Uh, so if you don't get funded in the first round, it essentially means you go another year. Uh, so I, I think you're, we're at least um, maybe not quite a full two years away, uh, but that's, that's probably likely. It could be a little longer. I suppose uh, any idea of uh, when, when the construction, let's say it starts on the fast track in uh, early or uh, mid-2022, uh, uh, any idea how long the construction might, might take before somebody can go in there and live in these apartments? Yeah, it, it's probably uh, at least a year and a half worth of construction. Um, you know, it might, could be a little longer than that, depending on how it goes. But um, thankfully, the building's not occupied, so we don't have that type of a challenge, but it is a very intricate, uh, detailed reuse. Uh, and so it'll, to do it well, so that um, the Briscoe Village for Living in the Arts is sort of a stewarding, it's been stewarded for its next century of service to the community, is going to take some real effort uh, and strength by a lot of intelligent people like Thad and others. Uh, and so we're, we're grateful for the team we have with our partners at Beacon Communities. Um, uh, and uh, it will be a deep, deep dive to make sure that this is excellent and durable uh, for a very long time to come. And that'll take a while, so. Well, I don't know if you heard that. That was my, that was my timer. And uh, uh, you, you, you finished right on time there, Andrew. Thank you for that. Well, yeah. I, I, I want to, I, I mean, I, I, I can't think of two more capable individuals. I know you will, you know, disclaimer, I know both these gentlemen personally and, uh, and I love them both. And I, I know that under your, uh, your jurisdiction, under your, uh, your, your guidance, this will be a fantastic project. Um, and I wanna thank you for, uh, for being my guests today. Uh, Andrew DeFranza, Executive Director of the um, Harbor Light Community Partners and that Shemasco, uh, Shemasco Verbiage Design. Thank you, gentlemen. It was a pleasure, Walt. Thanks so Thanks. much. Thanks for having us. Okay, and I'd like to remind our viewers that you have been watching North Shore Journal, and I'll see you next time.